He holds a PhD in positive psychology and he's also a certified design thinker. So with this, we welcome Professor Christopher Abraham. So over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah, I need to ensure that, you know, one of the most uh, challenging things for a professor is what we call the graveyard shift, which is the post-lunch session. You know, people full of food, so we need to ensure that they are awake and alive. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. So my session for the next 25 minutes is about the future of marketplaces for e-commerce. I'm going to give you two tens. The first is 10 trends, 2019 on e-commerce, and that will be followed by 10 perspectives on what to answer and how do we address the future challenges of uh, marketplaces. I want to start by saying that we live in incredibly brilliant times. I mean, some of you may beg to differ and say, well, the world is getting bad. Uh, I have good news for you. As uh, the person who introduced me, Mr. Samit, said that I have a PhD in positive psychology, which is nothing but the science of happiness. So obviously, uh, I can tell you with data, that's for another day, but that the world is actually getting better. If you don't believe me, you can uh, uh, Google a book called Factfulness, which is by Hans Rosling, and it will give you data across countries, across sectors, across industries, and the world is actually getting better. Well, that's not my topic this afternoon. It's going to be the future of marketplaces in e-commerce, and without much ado, let me introduce you to the 10 trends which have been researched for 2019. Number one is activist consumers. These are a group of people who have now taken things seriously so that retailers, e-commerce specialists, business professionals, and business companies don't take them for granted. So consumers have started questioning the entire process, right from the source of goods to the way it's being packaged, to recycling, sustainability. There's a whole lot of very interesting activist behavior coming from the consumer's perspective. Some of us could be part of that legacy, that we are there you know, who also understand this. The good news is because of this activist consumerism, there is a certain element of fear among retailers, e-commerce professionals, that they don't get away with blue murder before it could be done. Uh, some of you may have heard of this um, protest that happened a couple of weeks back uh, with a pharma company in the U.S. which used to sell uh, opiates, you know, which were prescribed. And now it's created an opium addiction problem and they've taken to the streets. And these are people like you and me, common people who've taken it up. So activist consumers are now looming large, which is good because it means better products, better services, on-time deliveries, so on and so forth. So they even ask pertinent questions like, what kind of a box? How far has it been shipped? Where is this product being made? Is it being made ethically? Is it being you know, given the right kind of treatment? And is the brand socially responsible? Walmart, for example, the world's largest retail outlet, which had $450 billion turnover only last year, which was uh, more than the GDP of 153 countries in the world. Okay, so that's the kind of turnover. Understand sustainability and they've created a playbook on sustainability. And they're very serious about how they actually ensure that it works both online and offline. The second one is this phenomena that took, uh, you know, the e-commerce industry a few years back in a very interesting way, returns. Well, returns for genuine reasons, I think, are very relevant, but I think the end of free returns is now becoming more a norm than an exception. Increasingly, companies who are in the e-commerce space are understanding that people have done that. I mean, I used to live in Canada a few years back, and we would have this phenomenon of people just wanting a pair of you know, new clothes for a party, and then after a week, 10 days, because of the free return policy, would have to be returned. And many companies had this very interesting, no questions asked return policy. Now, a lot of us would be genuine when we actually want to return something which we don't want, but you have a lot of people who would also misuse it. 
So there is a new awareness that's happened. Your returns can and will be used against you. So that's the statistics. You can have a look at it. 300 billion in returns, which was a 53% increase in the last two years. And 10% of holiday sales were returned. So people go crazy when they are in holiday sales and they buy things which they probably don't want. And then they return it for all the right and wrong reasons. UP has estimated that one day in January alone, there was about 1.6 million returns. Kind of crazy shoppers, if I may say that. Right. And so returns are now increasing 15, 30%. So there is a lot of return happening. So some companies have taken it up very seriously in Canada. H&M no longer accepts returns in stores. So if you have to return it, you've got to pay postage. You've got to pay for the courier to get it done back so that you understand and feel the pinch for it. Amazon again, 5 billion packages, 2017 must be more, last year with Prime alone and then has now 600 brick and mortars where customers return a means to reduce the returns tax. Right, the third one is tax which never used to be a norm year but last year we saw the opening of a new tax a system, a tax structure, and we're now getting used to it. Interestingly, the, uh, the process of implementing it had been very smooth, and last year we've lapped it up, so 5% plus has become now the norm here. So again, in online, across the world, you find online retailers now charging what we call online sales tax. But it does have a negative impact, but increasingly, Countries are bringing this across and you would have to pay the sales tax, whether it's online or offline. In fact, you have software that specializes in it. You have softwares here that do the same thing. In the US, Canada, this is a very popular software which gets tax compliance done right. And Amazon, of course, in the US and Canada again has started you know, charging taxes online for online purchases. So it's becoming more a norm than an exception. So progressive web application is the new norm. Uh, there's an interesting research that says there's hardly any apps that are downloaded by mobiles. It used to be the norm a few years back, but increasingly we are moving to something called PWAs, which is progressive web apps, which are seamless between mobiles and web. So uh, you can't call it just mobile, you can't call it just web. It's seamless between mobile and web, and it's becoming much more fluid and much more faster. And uh, so sites, apps, apps as we see, you know, it's becoming less and less relevant because PWAs are faster, you get straight to the web, you know, website, and you can add it to a home screen without uh, even requiring any updation. So obviously it becomes relevant. So apps as we know them a few years back are now becoming extinct, which is interesting because this is directly related to the push off uh, e-commerce and online businesses. Westel, which is uh, primarily a furniture and home decor company, saw a 15% increase in their time being spent online, on site, and a 9% increase in revenues per visit, which is pretty good. And Lancome Paris again rebuilt its mobile site with a, as a PWA, progressive web app, web app. And the conversions have gone up 17% with mobile sessions increased to 51%. So again, push notifications increasing, helping in recovering the recovered costs. Social media, which used to be just a friendly transactional platform, is now becoming more commercial. Increasingly, we find that customers are chatting with friends no, would also like to buy their things within the social media platforms, buying directly on social media. And some interesting indicators, 87% of e-commerce shoppers believe social media helps them make a shopping decision. One, because of the power of influence, because you have peer group that tells you whether the product is good or bad. And two, because it's convenient. And one in four business owners are currently selling through Facebook, notwithstanding Mark Zuckerberg's uh, you know, extraneous uh, experiences of privacy and uh, data secrecy. 40% of merchants use social media to gen generate sales, and 30% say 
They would make purchases directly through social media platforms. Instagram is currently rumored to be working on a fully shoppable app and has introduced shopping. It's already happening selectively with a few of their customers. When I say a few, few hundred thousand customers that they're working on, and now it would probably become more popular and more relevant across uh, Instagram users across the world. Google Express is also through a, so, though not a social platform, is consolidating merchants into a single card for consumers. So it's a platform that is gathering all merchants together so that it becomes seamless for the consumers to look at different alternatives in terms of when and how they should purchase. So AI is going to become the norm. So we have heard of AI being a backend, but now this year there's a prediction that we would have artificial intelligence as a full-fledged employee as part of the e-commerce system, which is going to help improve the search engine optimization and merchandising and also better product content. Some of us may know that Alibaba is one of the most extensive users of machine learning and artificial intelligence and uses an uh, AI-based copywriting tool that can produce 20,000 lines of content and copy within a second. Okay, and is used a million times every day by vendors. Amazon's AI itself is very, very articulate and is a real-time product of recommendations are given, which is available to merchants who use the Amazon Web Services console. Adobe took over Magento, and which was a $1.68 billion acquisition. And again, it helps bring merchants and brands automate them personalized recommendations. So AI would become more a norm. We don't need to worry much about it because it's still artificial. And as long as human beings have the natural intelligence intact, uh, you don't need to feel threatened. QR is no longer app-based. It's become seamless, so you don't need to look at an app. You don't need to download an app, which is all extra headaches. It's now fulfilling its potential directly and seamlessly helping brands provide product information. So 28% of consumers regularly purchase items online after researching them offline. And Deloitte's research predicts that the share of consumers who will check out products in a physical store before buying them has gone up by to 48%. And a QR scan can certainly give a brand or a merchant more influence over store to web purchases. And the reverse application of this is Amazon Shopping App provides a strong, this is interesting, a strong object recognizing function which uses a markerless AR, augmented reality functionality. Markerless is the opposite of market-based visual recognition, which is a QR code, which would be a marker. So we're looking at the opposite of that also happening, at least from the market leaders like Amazon. And many retailers are role modeling Amazon. So we call it the Amazonification of major retailers. So rather than fight Amazon and, of course, Alibaba, they're becoming partners to these platforms to ensure that together, in fact, the world is moving from competition to co-opetition. There are no longer enemies, but you have frenemies. So the new mantra is about collaboration and cooperation rather than on competition. And Jeff Bezos, of course, said that marketplaces are eating the world. We're moving towards a new specter of marketplaces which provide different opportunities, different plethora of choices for consumers across. Half of all merchandise sold on Amazon comes from third-party sellers. 12% of major retailers currently operate marketplaces. 32 are considering, so probably if we have a presentation next year, we might have about 40 to 50% of major retailers having their own marketplaces. And 86% of retailers believe it's crucial to own the consumer transaction and the relationship. The best way to do it is to create the right kind of marketplace. Best Buy Canada, once an electronic specialty store, capitalized on its market-leading traffic, over 20 million visits a month, by integrating a marketplace and quickly doubled its online SKUs and expanded to other things, among others, jewelry, 
furniture and baby products. Best Buy, as many of us know, used to be only an electronic store. So they're looking at multivarious product offerings online. Walmart Canada started a marketplace feature. They realized that it would double their online product assortment and as a result, increase the sale. Ninth trend is in-car e-commerce, shopping on the go. So again, a lot of us would not really like to drive because thankfully we're gonna have driverless cars, which means the driver, the quote unquote driver, would have more time to shop. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, let's say encouraging that, but that's gonna be more a norm than an exception. The new drive to store, as we call it. So our driving behavior and locations have monetary value, not unlike our search activity. So Benny & Co, which is a chicken uh, company, says in our rotisseries, you know, the rotating chicken one, so uses Waze, which is an app, as you know, uh, to show commuters spins near them, near the company, driving dinner time traffic to their 48 rotisserie chicken restaurants. Ashley Home Store is, again, a furniture company, which, uh, again, provides, uh, you know, this kind of facility using maps so that people can come and buy more. Last one is product content syndication. So brands and manufacturers have reclaimed control over their product content. So Walmart, again, operates the second largest marketplace after Amazon, as we know has imposed product syndication tools to its suppliers in order to have the best and most up-to-date product content on its platforms. InRiver, which is a product management information system, is again, a very, very useful in terms of connecting brand manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. So again, it's coming into content syndication, providing a much better content sourcing for consumers alike. So my first 10 trends are over and I'm going to ask you 10 questions, which would probably be the perspective in terms of what we need to look for in a marketplace in the 21st century. Does your marketplace make behavior dramatically easier and more efficient? We may not like this, but if you do the right cues, we can actually create buying behavior habits among consumers. Stanford professor Nirial B.J. Fogg, they've done a lot of research on how you can influence consumers' habits by creating certain cues. So the question is, do we do that and can we do that? Alibaba does that by making transactions between US and China seamless and as a result, more products, more sales, more seamless transactions. Second important question, does your marketplace produce more value than current markets? then yes, it's definitely time to look at marketplaces as an option. Airbnb completely changed the hospitality industry. It made a complete turnaround in terms of how we look at rooms, how we look at vacations, how we look at homestays, and have radically changed it. Last year, in fact, they made a few billion dollars, more than the biggest hospitality chains in the world. Third question, does your marketplace utilize a new technology to create efficiencies? And that's an ongoing, continuous process. Your marketplace has to update, as we saw in some of the trends that are happening in 2019. You need to be updated with the latest technology. Some of you may be familiar with OpenTable, which has adopted the high-speed internet access, both from the consumers and from the restaurant's perspective. And what they've created is an absolutely seamless web-based reservation platform that actually ensures that consumers don't need to wait, they don't need to look at different options, it becomes seamless and speedy. The fourth question you would like to ask is, does your marketplace consolidate a fragmented market? Today it's possible, thanks to networks, thanks to what Parag Khanna would call connectography, a world connected not by geographical borders, but by technological interconnectedness. So Kickstarter, which is the open source uh, finance platform, provides a unique opportunity both for would-be wannabe entrepreneurs and investors to come together to look at product ideas, business ideas, and of course invest in them relevantly. And because of the seamless integration of these two parties, the fragmentation is now becoming less and less 
and you don't have a few players playing it, which is pretty good. The fifth question is, does your marketplace make it easier for your suppliers to sign up? Because again, how seamlessly can you get the people to get on board? Uh, in fact, uh, Robin Hood, which is uh, a fancy term for an insurance integration and stock market platform, actually launched six months before its official launch by teasing customers to sign up with them with a lot of freebies. And guess what? Even before the official app could be launched, you had more than a million customers who had signed up the beta version and started using it in more ways than one. Etsy is a classic example of how you do that with handcrafted goods, making it simple to sell handcrafted goods across the world in minutes. The sixth question we'd like to ask is, does your market serve a larger market? The marketplace serving up a larger. And eBay is a classic example of that, which serves a large market of online buyers and sellers for just about anything. In fact, one of my friends quoted that if you could you know, sell your mother-in-law and if there's anybody to buy her, well, you could do that in eBay, depending on who wants to buy your mother-in-law. The seventh question is, can your marketplace bring in unserved customers and expand the market? Well, if it can do that, then yes. Old Desk is a classic example of that, which expanded the market for software outsourcing by making it simple enough for just about anyone to use it, ease of use. The eighth question is, does your market serve a frequent need? Because at the end of the day, every product and service actually satisfies a customer's need. And what do we call a need? A need is a felt deprivation of something that we don't have. Once we feel that, then can our product or service fulfill that? That's what Grubhub did when they served a frequent need for many office workers by providing them daily food delivery. The ninth question is, does your market control the transaction? Who controls the transaction? Uber is at the center of the payment system and it coordinates between the rider and, of course, the driver and provides a seamless payment transaction. Of course, we have variations. We have Karim, which is now being taken over by Uber. Some of you may be familiar. We have uh, versions across the world uh, of the Ubers, you know, or the Uber models across different parts of the world. The last question is, does your marketplace leverage a network effect? YouTube is a classic example for that, which makes it more valuable when more people view a particular video which is being placed. And we know this because when you have more subscribers, when you have more views, obviously it becomes a, a virtuous cycle which provides opportunities and revenues for every party in the commercial cycle. So 10 different trends, 10 different questions. The future of marketplace is going to stay, as we saw. It will be a seamless omni-channel integration between offline and online. And increasingly, we will have more customers who want to buy 24-7. And I want to end this with a little personal incident. So we were, you know, the family was getting together, three kids, mom and dad. At 2.30 a.m., you know, they decide they feel hungry. And Mama obviously was in the family mode, so she wasn't interested to cook anything. So they pick up the phone, call up Zomato at 2.33 in the morning, and get hot pizzas delivered 40 minutes thence. This is where the world is moving. 24-7, online, anytime, is how the world is moving. Are we ready for it? Is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Thank you very much, and good luck. My dear friend, Professor Christopher, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, tell me. Um, great presentation, I have one question for you. Sure. What do you think is the future of marketplace for regulated industries? Because there are a lot of rules and procedures and things that you know the providers need to follow in order to get there. And I see that as a pretty much a white space. Uh, what are your views on that? Well, it's my personal opinion. Look at what's happening in the banking and insurance industries. When FinTech took over, you know, we know that 
The good thing is that all data can be collected, all data can be consolidated in a platform, in a cloud, right? So that's possible. So today you don't need to, let's say, for example, have paper documentation. So when data is made available, and data is what the regulators want, they want to know what's happening, where, when, how, by whom, right? And if all these answers can be answered by data on a cloud, on a platform, I think that should uh, be the way forward. I don't see a challenge there. Where I see the challenge is the human resistance to change, you know, which has always been there. But then, you know, once they know that they can't uh, avoid, they would assimilate it. But I think that's where the world will be. In, in, in these regulated industries, you need to prove that the pr provenance of the people or the product. How do you do that? See, again, I believe, again, it's my personal opinion, I believe that because of the network, because of the connectivity, today, you know, one of the first things I spoke about was activist consumerism. Today, if I feel that my bank is treating me badly, and this actually happened, I don't want to name the bank and shame them in front of such a large audience, but I can tell you I was treated badly and I wanted to bash them. You know, you can't physically bash them. So you go online, and I just put the name of the bank, space, sucks, there was actually a website dedicated for that bank, which said, that bank sucks. So I think this kind of connectivity will bring in the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, regulatory uh, scenarios inside. Because of the connections. And you have WhatsApp, you have Instagram, so people immediately share information. Some of you may know the story of this guy who, uh, you know, who was a bathroom singer, but he was very passionate about his guitar. And he wanted to carry his guitar on United Airlines. He couldn't do that. So what he did was he requested that you guys take care of the guitar. Unfortunately, they didn't take care. The guitar broke. And this guy wanted to get money back. He said it's going to cost a few hundred dollars. They showed him the fine print at the back of the, you know, the, the ticket, which said a maximum of $30 is the damages we're going to pay. So the guy goes home, strums uh, a music, and says United breaks guitars. And he put it on YouTube. First day, there were probably about 10 or 15 people who saw it. Second day, a few hundred people. Within a few days, the video went viral and a few million people had watched the video. And then United said, could we, could we stop this nonsense from being propagated? You can't, because that's the public space. That's the social media space. So I think increasingly, regulators, along with traders, retailers, would become cognizant of this and become more and more you know, ethical for the right reasons, if I may say so. Yeah? <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much.